Hello and a very warm welcome back to The Garden. Today's video I'm going to be sharing with you 10 lessons that I've learnt with Ways of Ed Gardening. So if I could only share 10 to any gardener, beginner or with a bit of experience, these are the 10 chosen ones. The first lesson is that raised beds have wetter and drier areas. So all the way around the edge of a raised bed, that's actually gonna dry out the soonest. So if you wanna be clever about it, you can plant more kind of drought tolerant or low water tolerant crops, for example, this quinoa here, and then save the middle of the bed for plants that do like a lot more moisture, such as brassicas and lettuces. If you're growing the same crop in a raised bed from the middle to the edge, whenever it comes to hand watering, just water a little bit extra around the sides versus in the middle, and that will help ensure a nice consistent amount of moisture for the plants. The second lesson is that on a slope, raised beds do work versus doing a tiered system, which is often a lot more expensive. Now, if your slope is kind of south, southeast facing, this is perfect because you're actually angling the soil closer to the sun. Just like a solar panel, you put that on an angle, for example, a roof, you're not just gonna put it on the flat ground because you get better solar gain. And the dark soil of a raised bed can actually act as a bit of a solar panel itself. It can hold the thermal energy for the sun. It means that early in the day, the soil warms up quicker, which gives you a bit of an extra boost and head start around the start and the end of the growing season. One downside though of using raised beds with slopes is gravity. If your soil isn't quenching the water straight away and you get a lot of heavy rain, it can actually start to move and shift some of the soil down to the bottom of the bed. So the way to adjust that is just every autumn, rake a little bit over, back up to even it. If it means growing food versus not growing food, it's definitely worth doing. A huge benefit of using wooden raised beds in particular is that it actually serves as a nice foundation on which you can build or add different accessories very easily to your bed. For example, this is a trellis that I made around about four years ago now, and it's still standing out of the way of putting, say, a trellis within the bed. So you're actually maximizing the amount of space that you have. So you can get really clever with trellises, even attaching a cold frame, anything that can help you make the most of your space. As well as being able to attach different accessories to a side of a wooden raised bed, another benefit is that you can actually use the sides as seating around the garden. And that's actually something really nice if you need a coffee break or you want to look at something, being able to sit virtually anywhere is a massive benefit. One of the biggest lessons has actually been how wide should raised beds be? I've settled to what I think is a perfect size for access on all sides, which is 1.2 meters or four foot wide. This means whether you're on one side or the other, you can comfortably reach in to the middle of the bed. When you have a bed that's wider than four foot, you'll find yourself having to put your foot in to do a little bit of work and that isn't something that you want to do in terms of disrupting the soil. The fifth lesson is probably the biggest one because it influences so many different things. The first is being a set size and raised and it actually has a physical border. It means unlike a border bed or an in-ground bed, the grass around it never encroaches onto the bed, which means that the bed is always going to stay the exact same size rather than getting maybe a little bit smaller over time or a little bit wider. And that makes it much easier for planning exactly how many plants you want to put into an individual bed. Moving on from the fact that raised beds never change size, the other real benefit of them is actually it splits up a whole garden into manageable bite-sized chunks. One of the things that I really actually like to do is to treat each bed as if it's its own garden. So if I am ever feeling a little overwhelmed, I can just focus on one area rather than looking at the whole garden. And you can actually take this a step further and have raised bed themes. So for example, one bed could be a salad garden, another bed could be a herb garden, maybe an edible flower garden. And it's a really nice way to split up your space and keep it nicely managed. This also creates another benefit of splitting your garden into bite-sized chunks because 
weeding means that you can just focus whenever you come up into the garden on a couple of beds at a time and suddenly it makes the whole task feel a lot less overwhelming. The final thing is if suddenly life gets really busy and you're struggling with time for your garden, you can do one of two things. The first is you could just bulk plant one crop in a raised bed, for example, a load of kale or potatoes. So you can just quickly plant it up, let plants grow, occupy it for a few months and then harvest it. So you can kind of save a bit of time there. Or secondly, you can put the bed into dormancy stage by just covering it with a few layers of cardboard. And when you do have the time to dedicate to that bed, pull off the cardboard and plant straight into right away. Against perhaps popular belief, I actually think it's easier to do slug control with raised beds. There's a few reasons why. Firstly is if you have ducks and you wanna put ducks through your garden, the raised beds is often enough of a deterrent to stop them having to actually jump up. Instead, they can go around the grass and look for slugs. The other thing is that it makes it really easy to put planks against the side of a bed, which then you can capture slugs. And also we've got a, uh, we've got a snail here that I will uh, rehome at a later date. But it just makes it very simple to go around and attach planks either onto the ground or onto the side to then capture any potential slug problems. Also, when you're doing a slug bust in the night and you're going out and you're looking for slugs, it's actually, I think, much easier to find slugs because you've got the path and then you've actually got a clear bit of space. So unlike trying to look for slugs on soil or on leaves, you can actually see when they're moving from one bed to another. What I found that helps the most with dealing with slugs is actually just taking a little pride with your garden and keeping it nice and tidy. So if you have any pots or planks just lying about, just put them away because that's perfect slug habitat. And also if you have grass around the edges of your garden, just try and keep it as low as possible. Another important lesson is that the yield and productivity of a bed is controlled by how healthy the soil is. And to actually prioritize the soil, the health of the soil, over the plants because if you focus on the soil and you make that as healthy as possible that makes the biggest difference. Right here we've planted some green manures so we've got field beans that have been interplanted with buckwheat because one of the most important things to do is to have plants growing in the ground as much as possible. Around 10 to 40 percent of the sugars and the other molecules that plants create via photosynthesis are sent out by their roots to feed soil life, which in return will give your plants the nutrients that they're looking for. So things, for example, mulching with compost, mulching with grass clippings, which has been a massive one this year, if you're okay on in terms of slug populations, and then growing as many plants throughout the season as possible. An easy way that you can start improving soil health starting today is whenever you're removing plants, for example, these lettuces have started bolting, is to cut the plants at the base. So you leave the roots in the ground. This is gonna go into the compost, but leaving the roots in the ground is a great way to add carbon, which is one of the most important molecules for a healthy, thriving soil. One of the biggest lessons that I've learned with gardening using raised beds is actually to carefully consider how different crops grow. Here I've got nasturtiums, it's quite a nice trailing plant. So actually growing it on the edge of a bed, allowing it to take up some of the pathway is a great way to create space for growing more crops inside. Another example here is ochre. If I plant ochre on the side and let it grow out, it opens up for more space within the bed to continue planting extra plants, which leads to better productivity. Within a polytunnel, in one of our polytunnels, we actually have a load of tumbling tom tomatoes cascading over the side of a bed. So just think about how a plant grows and how you can use it to the advantage with the height of a raised bed to actually grow over the top so you get all of this extra growing space and open up more space within. The edges of a raised bed is very useful, but one of the most exciting areas is, I think, the corner of a raised bed. Firstly, because it's the perfect place to put in a wigwam. A wigwam is a great way to 
adds a lot of vertical interest and structure to a garden. It kind of fits neatly out of the way to open up the rest of the bed and it also creates another corner which you can use. So this corner here we're growing, uh, well we were growing dill and now we're saving it for seed, but another amazing useful corner of a raised bed is to grow plants for pollinators and other beneficial insects. Just dedicating a little area to bring those into the garden is gonna massively boost and help overall garden health which in turn is gonna have a positive impact on the total yields of the garden, but also how nice and beautiful it looks. A big lesson for me is that direct sowing is often an underrated way of starting seeds for raised beds. In this day and age, there's a lot of emphasis on modules and transplanting like the seedlings behind me, but these winter radish were sown direct and we've been doing a lot quite recently, especially with the green manures. It's a lot more simple in terms of starting off and you just need that bit of confidence but I think the thing that really wins it for direct sowing is that the plants actually grow healthier and they're more resilient to dry weather because when I pull up a plant that has been transplanted by a module versus a plant that has been sown directly the direct sown plants always have a much better root system. When it comes to raised beds there's two kind of main materials leading the race in terms of popularity and that's wooden beds and metal beds and you might be wondering what is the best choice i've written a detailed blog post comparing the two there's a link down below so give it a read and hopefully it'll help you understand all of the key benefits between the two types of materials. And if you like this content and want to support the projects that we do on this channel and beyond, the easiest way to do that is to get all of your gardening supplies, for example, cold frames, tools, and seeds from hughesgarden.com. I'll see you again next week.